intend to do is to use the dialectic method in this discussion. What I say is I'm going to use the dialectic method in this discussion. What I simply mean is that we need to avoid one-sidedness. In this discussion, for this discussion to be meaningful to all of us, we need to look at all the sides. It's the only way we can have a full picture of what we need to discuss and so on. <clears throat> now, my first submission is that the right of free expression is, is absolutely important when it comes to discussions of all aspects of journalistic practice. Because if you do not believe in free expression, then when people express themselves freely, you will beat them up, you will lock them up, you will poison them, you will kill them, and so on. So it is fundamental, the right of free expression. I want to submit that as journalists, sometimes we tend to be just too harsh on ourselves, unnecessarily too harsh on ourselves. There have been many occasions when I've listened to journalists speak, especially when they speak about the responsibility of the press and so on. And I wonder whether they are talking about Ghana. In this very room, some of the best in our profession, who could have practiced anywhere in the world as excellent journalists, are here in this very room. I mean, there is Razak El Alawa, three times best journalist of the year, and who still continues to write in the Daily Graphic and so on. Never in his practice have I heard anybody allege irresponsibility on his part of publishing falsehood or whatever. Never throughout his, his profession. I think we should clap for that. Yeah. And then in this very room is my classmate who actually started to practicing his journalism long before he graduated from the Ghana Institute of Journalism in 1974. He was edited newspapers and magazines here and outside, practiced in London and so on. I'm talking about Ebo Kwanza, who sits here, one of the best, and has the quality, world-class quality, and so on. And then there are those who are not here, like Kabrabli and me here, excellent journalists by all standards. And, and many more. Uh, there's this friend of mine, Francisco Kuche, who writes for international journals. There's Cameron Dodu and so on. So why are we so harsh on ourselves? Why do we create the impression that when it comes to the Ghanaian media, we're a bunch of irresponsible people, not interested in telling the truth and so on? That's a problem with our own perception of ourselves. We are not that bad. And it's important to make that point all the time. And indeed, those who, who challenged those beliefs were killed. It was so bad that they had death sentences for challenging those beliefs that today we know are not, are not the truth. And so, on. so what is the truth? And, and we can go on and on and on about many more things. I mean, until recently, scientists were united in their belief that we as human beings are products of some evolution and so on. That the whole world is, is, is a product of evolution, the theory of evolution. Now, scientists know that the theory of evolution is false. And that, that it has been replaced by the theory of the Big Bang, that spark of energy which started the universe and other universes and so on. So at the time that we were being taught the theory of evolution, was it a lie? Today, the theory of the Big Bang, is it a lie? And so on. So these are some of the things that we need to constantly examine so that we are not too harsh on ourselves and so on. Now, when it comes to issues of safety, and I'm coming home to, to the topic that I'm supposed to address. What are we talking about? I think we are talking about safety from physical attack. That's one, physical attack, safety from physical attack. Somebody coming with a crowbar and knocking you on the head. Somebody shooting you, somebody beating you up. 
somebody restraining you so you do not have access to places and so on. Physical, physical safety. That is part of the discussion. There's another part of the discussion that we don't do very much. And that happens to be psychological violence. The kinds of things that are done to journalists because of what they believe, because of what they stand up for, because of what they write. And psychological violence can oftentimes result in physical disability. I'm not a medical practitioner, but I have experiences to share about myself. I used to have low blood pressure, very low blood pressure, to the extent that some of my doctors thought that there was a problem. I just thought that it was normal and so on. By the time I had gone through two to three years of fighting the allegation that somebody had paid me $125,000, I become hypertensive. <laughs> and I now have to take drugs on a daily basis in order to stay healthy. Is that, is that struggle part of my health condition today? There are many journalists who are having problems with their liver, with their heartbeats, and so on. How much of, of the pressure that is put on them as a result of their commitment to their profession results in these health conditions? So when we are talking about safety, I think we need also to think about the psychological pressures, the psychological attacks on journalists, and so on. They are also so very important. And then there are many others, but I'd like to come home because we don't have enough time to look at some of these issues and, and, and so on. You see, we work in, in some environments. Some of us work in offices, we work in editorial rooms, and so on. Those places need to be secured. In fact, if you go to newspaper offices in some advanced countries and so on, you cannot just walk in and see a journalist. There are security systems that you must go through. Electronic security, physical security, some journalists have bodyguards, and so on. Now, if you work in our environment, and let's be honest about our environment, where many of the media houses cannot generate advertising revenue sometimes to cover 20% of operational costs, how do you provide that level of security? Because that level of security is very expensive. So the provision of security itself is, is directly related to our capacity to earn. And our capacity to earn is also directly related to the state of the national economy. When inflation is flying into the skies, when the relationship between the city and the dollar goes haywire and so on, when businesses cannot survive, they don't advertise. And when they don't advertise, we in the media do not make money to take care of our security. And I think we need to understand these relationships. We understand. Part of the problem also has to do with us. Part of the problem has to do with us. We are not just journalists. And this is the most unfortunate part when it comes to professional practice in Ghana. I am CPP, he is NDC, he is MPP, and he is PPP, and so on. So rather than come together to protect our professional space, we are fighting to protect spaces outside our profession. Yeah. You understand? So we are not behaving like doctors, we are not behaving like lawyers and so on. In our profession, we are so divided that we cannot come together to protect ourselves as journalists. So if he's perceived to be an NBC journalist, then we must undermine him and undermine what he's doing. We must waste psychological warfare on him and destroy him and so on. So the need for unity amongst ourselves as professionals to protect our professional space 
to make sure that we build institutions and structures for protecting our safety and so on is important. And you see, my brother, I have often made some passing remark. It is a passing remark, but it's, it's very important. When I leave my house at Musuku and come here to join discussions like this, I come solely as a journalist. I leave my religious beliefs in my church and my house. So when we come here and we impose religion on ourselves and so on, first of all, we abuse the secular character of the Ghana Journalist Association. We impose pressures on ourselves and we draw the lines of division amongst ourselves. An atheist should be able to become the president of the Ghana Journalist Association in much the same way that a Muslim can become president of the Ghana Journalist Association and in much the same way that a traditionalist can become president of the Ghana Journalist Association. So please take religion and all those things that divide us out of our association. It's important that you take those things out. Because if you take those things out, you help us to come together to build a solid platform of journalists committed to free expression and to fight together to defend ourselves. Our unity is important in providing for our safety. You understand? It's very, very important for us to understand this very, very clearly. Now, our safety in, at the individual level, it's also related to what comes into our pocket and what leaves our pocket and so on. And that is why I think that the presentation which was made today by our sister from the trade union movement is most important. But you see, unfortunately, and it is not her fault, she doesn't know our profession and can never know the profession like us. There are people in this profession who earn more than ministers. They earn far more than ministers and chief executives of other institutions and so on. It's a fact. Indeed, today, journalism has become like international football. Journalism has become like international football. I know of a case of a friend of mine who was being signed on as a morning show presenter for a new radio station. Amongst the conditions that were demanded and fulfilled included a brand new Mercedes 300. Brand new Mercedes 300. That's more than $100,000. C350, well, he's confirming C350 Mercedes. Plus other conditions, and some of the conditions are mind boggling. I'm sure that none of those conditions were reflected in the survey done by the trade union movement. Otherwise, the average this would have changed. You understand? <laughs> but it's important. I know of, 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 of ordinary presenters who work for two hours a day, and they earn far, far more than some of the most senior public servants in our society and so on. You understand? Indeed, I was in the same classroom with the book answer. And Ebokwansa will recall that one of the greatest teachers of journalism for all time in Ghana, Sam Atta, yeah, absolutely. used to remind us constantly as journalists that what you become in the profession does not depend on your certificate and does not depend on all those things that happen in other professions. It depends largely on your relevance to society. And throughout my practice, I've come to appreciate that throughout my practice. Now look, in our profession, and I, I want us to be open, I want to give you the benefit of what I've been through. It may not be the best, but I've been through a lot. I did my first radio program in 1969. 1969 was the first time I did a radio program. So, so we can go on and on and on. But I just wanted to give you some benefit. Look, me. The day I decide to take salary 
from the newspaper that I founded, ran, and edit. That is the day the newspaper will collapse. <laughs> because that newspaper cannot pay me. It is impossible. You cannot pay me. I'm the founder, owner, and editor of that newspaper. So there are many people here. I saw Kinte Man somewhere. Uh, he's there. He's, he's done it before. He will tell you his experience. I can see Mackay here. He will tell you his experience. What has become known as Daily Guide? Do you know the history how it started? It started as a fighting machine. It did not start as a business. It started because there was an opening in the struggle for democracy. They thought they had a contribution to make. So when Kwaku Baku, Freddie Blay, and others came together to found Daily Guide, they were not counting pennies and cities. They were counting the liberty of the Ghanaian people and so on. If anybody counted pennies and cities, the Daily Guide would not have been established. And we have to bear that in mind. Now listen, I'll tell you something. I mean, in this discussion, we've gone into some strange description of workers. People who work for no pay are not workers. They must be either slaves, <laughs> volunteers, or something else. So the definitions are very, very important. I mean, today, this morning, I had a conversation with the chairman of this morning's function and uh, and I think, yeah, I think you were also there upstairs before we came down. And one of the things that we're talking about is the fact that you have the Ghana Institute of Journalism here with more than 4,000 students. And the number keeps increasing and that's only one institution. This year, more than 1,000 people are going to come out of this institution. Where are they going? Who is going to be able to pay them? And is it better that they roam the streets? Or is it better that they go under some apprenticeship and so on, which can eventually make them, turn them into Razak El Alawa and so on? These are important questions for us to ask. And when I started doing my internship at Graphic and so on, there were people in graphic who were not being paid at all. Razak, tell me. People worked in graphic for four or five years before they got onto the payroll, and they worked as volunteers. They are not workers, they were volunteers. Based on the experiences they gathered and so on, some of them rose to become editors of graphics. Some of them went out and became giants in the media practice. Is this something we want to kill today? I am not so sure that we want to kill this practice today. Look, me, I happen to be editor of a newspaper. I am director of a television station and so on. And you know the rest and so on. I mean, there are many occasions where people come to you and they say, look, I've been to journalism school. I mean, there's a lady who came to us who has a master's degree. And I said, madam, we don't need you here. There's no space for you here. Because we can produce the news without you. We can do all the presentations without you. Master's degree. How am I going to find money to pay somebody with a master's degree? For goodness sake. And the lady says, I didn't come here for pay. I want an opportunity to learn. So I said, okay, if that is the case, come on board. Today, she's our best news anchor. On the basis of her performance over the last eight months and so on, I called her into my office and said, Madam, you stay somewhere beyond Athena. Oh. And sometimes by 5 a.m., you are here. Oh. I'm worried about how you manage to get money for your transport and so on. I said, Don't worry. And I said, I have to worry. So, on the basis of that, from today, we will sacrifice to give you a certain amount so that you can come to work. And so, if you send a questionnaire to her, what is she likely to say? <laughs> that she's unemployed, she's earning below the minimum wage, and so on. You want to stop her? And I have done some check. Yesterday, I was, I was pouring through the accounts of Pan-African television. 
And over the one year that we have operated, first of all, I have never had a payday from the television station. None of the directors have had a payday from the television station. The total revenue we have made as compared to operational costs is 12% of operational costs. So you have to take that reality also into account. Of course, it does affect the people who work in the media house. Even if they are slaves, it affects them. If they are volunteers, it affects them. You understand? The question we have to be asking ourselves is what can we do to make the business of running media in Ghana less cumbersome for everybody involved in the process and which would enable us to work to guarantee free expression, which would enable us to guarantee the safety of the people who work in the industry and so on. And there are many suggestions. Again, I'm happy that some of my colleagues are here. When I used to be the president of the Private Newspaper Publishers Association, one of the things that we noticed is that, look, the vendor, the newspaper vendor, what does he do? He doesn't write a story. He doesn't do editing. He doesn't suffer the insults and everything. You go and give him the newspaper. You, you produce your own newspaper. You take it and go and give it to the vendor. He takes 10% of the cover price free. Ah, 20% of the cover price. 20% of the cover price. And so, so we then thought that one of the ways of improving the viability of the industry, making sure that the industry can employ and pay well and so on, is to establish a newspaper distributing company owned by Primpark. You understand? Of course, it hasn't materialized yet. But these are some of the options open to us as journalists association, as print pack and so on, as independent broadcasters association and so on. What is it that we can do which would improve the viability of the media to enable the media meet its obligations to itself, to the slaves who work for it, to the volunteers who work for it and so on? These are important questions. Now, you see, in my sister's presentation, she makes the point that conditions are better for people working in the state-owned media. You need to go the step, one more step forward to ask why that is so. That is so because if I work in the Ghana News Agency and I worked in the Ghana News Agency as a senior reporter and later chief reporter for some time, whether your story is read or not, huh? Whether you write good stories or bad stories, at the end of the month, can Oforetta is going to find money to pay your salary and all your entitlements. It doesn't happen like that in the Chronicle. If your newspaper is not bought and read, finito, no money is coming. So that explains why in the state media, it appears that they are doing a little better. But you know something? In 1974, I did a story for the Ghanaian Times with one of my best friends, a famous young enterprising journalist called Fian Fiao. And we did that story, the late Fian Fiao, we did that story into the conditions of service of people working for the Trade Union Congress. And we found that people working, some people working for the unions and so on, were earning below the minimum wage. I'm sure you are all familiar also with the story which was published not too long ago, that even in Parliament, some of the workers were earning below the minimum wage. Those who are dependent on the consolidated fund, they were earning below the minimum wage. Of course, you've heard about the judicial service and, and their problems with remuneration and so on. What can we do to address these problems? And it's for this reason and other reasons that as an individual, uh, as an individual, oh, I beg, as an individual, I was wondering, really wondering, about the unionization of the Ghana Journalist Association. I was wondering, and I asked myself several questions. It is not because I'm opposed to unions. We do know 
that the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union operates in many of the media houses. The Public Services Workers Union, for example, is active in broadcasting house and so on. Those are trade unions. The Journalist Association, was it intended to be a trade union? This transformation, what does it mean? And, and so on. I mean, these are important questions that we need to ask. And it's not just about the Ghana Journalist Association. It's also about the Ghana Medical Association, which is more and more becoming a trade union. It's all about the other professional organizations which are more and more becoming trade unions. To the extent that now, the difference between professional organizations and trade unions is getting increasingly bled on a daily basis. Is that good for us? I don't know. These are issues that we should interrogate. Finally, I think my time is up. I would have liked to say a lot more things. I do hope that I have the opportunity to say it when it comes to the discussion time. But finally, 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 let me express my deepest appreciation to the leadership of the Ghana Journalist Association for bringing us together for such a discussion. It is important going forward that we create this forum and bring seasoned and, and senior people like Yao, like Ben Asori and others, so that we can think about our profession and how to improve our profession. So I'd like to thank Mr. Alfred Money and his executive for this great opportunity of bringing us together.